One day at school, while I was busy with my homework, suddenly a boy stormed in my place. Hey, beauty, I get a dare. Would you mind giving me a kiss? What? I very, very mind. Get off me. But he still leaned towards and trying to press his dry as the bark of a tree lips on mine. No way. All I gave him was a slap on the face to shake the last sense back to him. Come on. It's just a true for dare game. Don't need to overreact like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just give him a kiss, Cheryl. And don't act so highly. It's not every day that someone offers to kiss you. <laughs> Gosh, these dudes might as well need to be taught a lesson then. Hey, stop. It's a game to you, but not to her. And she has a right to act on her own will. Huh? Andrew was defending me. What's wrong with him today? Who told you I need your help? Those boys really killed my mood today, that I couldn't focus on anything else. All of a sudden, I heard Green Day playing, and soon I lost my negative thoughts to the song, and became completely absorbed in it. And you know who's the idiot that played it. The next day, Diana took me out for some retail therapy. Hey, about yesterday, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine now. Such a relief, Cheryl. But... Just a little reminder, please don't misunderstand that my boyfriend has something with you. He was just being kind, you know. What? Me? With your boyfriend? As if! Even if he's the last boy on the planet, I'd never like him. <laughs> really? That's all I want to hear. I get this, please. Sometimes I couldn't understand my friend. But what if he still had feelings for me? Would I... What am I thinking? Get yourself together, Cheryl! After a fun shopping day, we separated and I went home to see Mr. Hardy wearing apron, doing something in the kitchen. Ah, you're home. Juliana is in Paris for two weeks. For some urgent business. Two weeks? How was I supposed to live with just these two obnoxious people for the whole two weeks? But wait, Juliana is on a business trip? How strange. She's never done that kind of thing. Right that moment, I got a message saying she had to fly out to negotiate some deal for the cosmetics she was using. Well, that explained. Perhaps getting married made her become more mature, I guess. Cheryl, go wash up. Dinner is waiting. I've prepared your favorite. And the food Mr. Hardy cooked was surprisingly delicious. More strangely, over the next few days, I realized being with them wasn't a nightmare as I thought it would be. Mr. Hardy was an excellent cook and always tended to my favorite list. So to pay back, I volunteered to do the cleaning. You're doing the dishes. Make sure you don't break any. Let me save them. No need. You do. He's right. I couldn't finish it all by myself. We were working peacefully when I felt something cold on my cheek. He's splashing water on me. Angrily, I splashed him back. It was fun, except for how soaked our hairs and shirts were. Gosh, how old are you both? One day after dinner, Andrew asked me to go with him to the grocery store. Okay, fine, but I wouldn't carry any bags. Then we took a stroll around the neighborhood. The city at night with flickering lights did have some soothing effect. Yours is chocolate, right? Can I take a bite? Then he had like half of my ice cream. Oops, sorry. You can have mine. That's fine. Seemed like our princess is in a good mood today. Normally you'd chase me all the way down the street. That's true. I hate to admit, but since Andrew and his dad moved in, I found myself happier and more relaxed. Hey, did I say something wrong? And for some reason, my words naturally blurted out about how lonely I had felt in my own house. When my parents passed away, Juliana is my only family, but she's too drowned in her own flashy hobbies, sparing no time for me. Not until recently, she spent more time at home, <sighs> which is good anyway. I didn't know that, Cheryl. So we have more in common than I thought. Actually, my childhood wasn't as wonderful either. My mom and dad got divorced when I was seven. I just thought it's because they're not meant for each other, but turns out mom was having an affair which made dad devastated and closed his heart to everyone until he met your aunt. Poor Mr. Hardy and Andrew. My aunt actually had changed ever since she's been with Mr. Hardy too. Maybe they're the right ones for each other. We kept walking along the riverbank and chatting with Andrew wasn't bad like I thought or even good in some way. Suddenly, he tripped over something and fell on the ground. Gosh, you're bleeding. Sit here, I'm gonna buy some bandage. But I didn't manage to get too far before witnessing a scene I wish I didn't. A day after Juliana came back from the business trip, she immediately called for a family meeting and announced the unexpected. Cheryl, Andrew, we have something to tell you both. Mr. Hardy and I decided our relationship has come to an end. What? Why so sudden? Dad? Mr. Hardy didn't say anything, but seemed not to take it well either. Then Andrew turned to me for an explanation, but I just couldn't bear his look. It's just, we realize we're not for each other. You'd better move out soon. Empty and awkward atmosphere covered the room. The news hit us hard. Mr. Hardy kept silent until they were about to go. You should cook for Cheryl more often. 
She likes stir-fry veggie. Drop it! Stop acting like you understand me better than my aunt! Get out of my house now! Take care, Cheryl. They've gone out of our lives, just like I always wanted. But what is this aching feeling? Days after, at school, Andrew kept trying to talk to me, but I avoided him by all means, until once he took me a surprise and pulled me to a corner. Cheryl, tell me why did they break up? You must have known something, right? I... I... Didn't you listen to my aunt? They're just not made for each other. You're... You're hiding something. Stop bothering me. We're not related anymore. I walked away as fast as possible. Seeing his face was the last thing I wanted now. Thank God Diana found me. I'm sorry for that, Cheryl. By the way, I dumped Andrew. Like father, like son. Better stay away from the mall. Yeah, it should have been that from the start. Things went peacefully for a week. Diana was always around, and soon my days were filled with her presence and care. I felt thankful to have a best friend like her around at this time. Then, one day, Andrew suddenly approached me in rage. It's you, right? What? Then he showed me the lipstick he found in his dad's bag, and some lip marks on his shirt as well. That's when he suspected Mr. Hardy was having an affair, causing the rift between him and Juliana. But Dad said he would never do that, and I trusted him. What happened with Mom devastated Dad, so no way would he do the same thing with anyone else, which left you the only one who's behind this, right? What? How is it here? Yes, it's me. It's me. So what? But why did you have to do it? Isn't it? The day after, I asked Diana to meet me in a cafe. Diana, my aunt and Mr. Hardy are getting back together. Can you believe? H how could it be possible? Ah, one more thing. You forgot this at my place? I... I... Why did you do this, Diana? Is it just because you're afraid I would steal your Andrew? I told you I'd never steal my bestie's boyfriend. What's going on here? Didn't we just fake date Diana? Andrew? You guys just faked a date? But why? Then he said that he just moved back here. He wanted to talk to me to untangle the misunderstanding in the past. In hopes everything would get cleared and we might get back together. But Diana approached him and suggested they fake date to see how I would react first. I thought it's kind of a good idea, so I agreed. Have you both lost your mind? Why did you suggest such a thing? It, it bugged me when seeing you living together, so... So I had to separate you again. Again? What does this mean? It's not the first time you did this, right? I... I... I couldn't bear seeing you together because... Because I like you, Cheryl. For a long time now. So back years ago, when you became Andrew's girlfriend for some stupid game, I tried to end it as soon as possible. Turns out, Diana paid the boys to fabricate the story of Andrew setting up the game to deceive me for money, and intentionally let me hear their conversation. So that meant I wrongly accused Andrew. I trusted you as a best friend and share everything with you, even my insecurities. But you just use it as a means to satisfy your selfishness? I... I didn't mean it. And now you're even willing to sabotage my family's happiness for your own needs. You've gone too far. Diana was wrong, but not this time. Actually, Andrew, Diana wasn't the reason why your dad and my aunt broke up. It's me. No, it's her who put the lipstick on my dad's back, remember? It's true, but my aunt never found this lipstick. Ironically, your dad was supposed to be accused of having an affair, but in fact, my aunt was the one who really did. You remember the night we went to the grocery store? I was looking for a pharmacy, but happened to see my aunt hands in hand with another man. Why is your Paris business trip involved having a fling with another man? Do I have to remind you that Mr. Hardy and you are getting married? Don't you love him? Cheryl, I love him dearly. I don't know what's gotten into me. I'm sorry. Say it to Mr. Hardy. That's when I know my aunt wasn't faithful to your dad, so I forced her to break up with Mr. Hardy immediately. Why keep it from us? I know your dad and you wouldn't take this well after what happened with your mom, so I didn't want to rub the old scars. I'm sorry, Andrew. I went home to see Juliana with her suitcases. Cheryl, you're home. Sit here. I want to talk to you. There's something I wasn't honest with you, Cheryl. Then she admitted that there's actually no gold diggers trying to deceive her. It's her who put all of the relationships in ruin, as she quickly got bored with them and quickly turned into another guy when still in a relationship. I lied because I don't want you to think ill of me, but I didn't expect it would make you hold a negative opinion on boys. Trust me, pumpkins. One day you'll definitely find a boy who loves you truly. Then hold him dearly, will you? Don't be like me. Lapsed up into old ways and ended up losing an incredible man. I'm glad you learned that. And now I have to go. I was asked to take care of you until you're 18. And hell, you are now. <laughs> I believe my pumpkin can live on her own feet from now. Bye. I hope you could lead your independent life too, auntie. Now, all the truth was revealed. Letting out the secret that was relieving after all. I was sitting on our favorite spot at school. But beside me wasn't Diana anymore. 
I got this letter from her in my locker this morning. Hi, Cheryl. I apologize again for my selfish acts. I should have known better that love cannot be forced, and I am also grateful to your big heart. I always cherish every moment shared with you. Though it's hard, I have to go now to find a way to heal myself. Take care, Cheryl. Diana. Kiss. My best wishes are with you, Diana. Why the dumb face? Without letting me crack a word, out of nowhere, Andrew snatched my earphones. Green Day? You're too predictable, Cheryl. Why are you here? I saw you sitting alone, so I guess you might need a companion. Yeah, Diana's moved to another city, you know. Yeah. She'll be fine. Andrew, I'm sorry for wrongly accusing you back then. I was too childish and impulsive. I should have listened to you first. That's fine. Actually, I have something to tell you too. You know, when you said you're the one who broke up Dad and Juliana, I was really angry. But, but a part of me was kind of happy, because that would mean you didn't want us to be cousins. Because I didn't want that either. I want more. Cheryl, would you be my girlfriend again? Hmm, let's see. I might or might not want that. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. I'd love to, Andrew. Then he pulled me for the most magical kiss ever. Ah, uh, I forgot. Dad asked you to drop by for dinner tonight. Did he? Yeah, I shouldn't miss that. I will ask him to make fried chicken burrito. Baked ZT? Greek salad? Isn't it too much? I'm not finished. So, my dream of conquering Hollywood and becoming a world-renowned actress is finally beginning. Today is my first casting. Oh boy, I hope it runs smoothly. Now I just have to change my clothes. I heard that Jenny Sinclair is here too. She's bound to get the main role as her billionaire dad is too influential for her to not to. Ugh, you mean Jenny? The talentless eye candy? She's nothing special. Her dad's loaded, and it's rumored her mom is a famous actress. But after giving birth to her, she abandoned her for a movie role. This is so unfair. How were we meant to compete with some rich girl with a paternal sob story? <sighs> yes, I'm Jenny Sinclair, the daughter of billionaire Rod Sinclair, and the rumored daughter of a mysterious famous actress. People think growing up in wealth means my life is super easy. Wrong! My dad refuses to talk to me about my mother, hence even I myself don't know who she is, and dad is also completely against my acting dreams. You see, I definitely needed to win this role on talent. Then they'd all take me seriously. It's almost my turn. I'm so nervous. The movie's called The Servant, so the main role is for the part of this maid, and Mrs. Sharma, a veteran actress who had just come back from Hollywood, will play the role of the ruthless mistress. Ah, this is it. Fingers crossed I don't forget my lines. Next, Jennifer Sinclair. Ignoring the buzzing gossip behind me, I confidently stepped onto the stage and smiled at Mrs. Sharma. She seemed a little surprised when she saw me. Fetch me a cup of chamomile tea. I was walking with the tray when, oops, I tripped and fell, and the cup shattered across the floor. You incompetent girl, you do realize that cup was worth more than you are? Huh? This wasn't in the script. Stunned, I just stood there with a confused look on my face. Poof, Miss Sinclair, how are you supposed to be an actress when your reactions are this abysmal? Acting is also about improvisation. Not just learning the script by heart, young lady. Jenny, you clearly didn't do your research, as you're clueless about this character. I regained my composure, hurriedly apologized to Miss Sharma, and begged the director to let me try one more time. I don't have time for this. How can a young girl who was born with a silver spoon in her mouth ever understand the life of a maid? Please leave. Other contestants are waiting. So... My dream casting became a nightmare. Ugh, it felt like the whole world was laughing at me. Miss, please get up. You need to eat something. Please don't be down. There'll be plenty of other opportunities. No, that was my big chance and I blew it. Lucas Hemingworth hates me. That basically means the whole industry will now shun me. Oh, him. My aunt's his housekeeper and she said he's a horror to work for. He's fired five housekeepers within the last month, and now nobody dares apply. Don't let him get you down. Everybody knows how obnoxious he is. Did you just say Lucas Hemingworth is looking for a maid, and you know the housekeeper there? 
Um, that's right, but this is the perfect way to show him that I'm not just a pretty face. I might seem like a spoiled rich girl. I sure still can play the role of a maid better than anyone else. Please help me, or else I'll go on a hunger strike. I, I... Before she had a chance to reply, I grabbed the glass of milk and glugged it all in one breath. Okay then, we have the deal now? Hey, it's me, Jenny. I pass for a maid now, right? Remember what I told you, and never set foot in the master's working room without being asked. Now go to the warehouse and get me the box of Christmas decorations. Ugh, this box was so heavy. Suddenly I bumped into something, and as I fell, all of the Christmas decorations scattered across the floor. Huh? What was beneath me? Oh no, I was lying on top of someone. Oh my god, it was Lucas. I quickly got off him and apologized, but he just tutted at me then walked off. I was feeling dumbfounded as I picked up the decorations when this girl approached me. You're the new maid, huh? Don't think that being pretty means you can seduce my dad to become a famous actress or something. Here's a piece of advice. Don't even dream about it. From now on, this maid serves me and only me. What a bummer. It was only my first day and I'd already got on the wrong side of Lily, the director's daughter. She already had a reputation in the modeling world for her extremely unpleasant personality. And indeed, from that day on, whenever she was home, she spent every second of her time tormenting me. Once, Lily asked me to bring her a cup of hot tea, but as soon as I put the tea tray down, she immediately changed her mind. She wanted her tea to be cool instead, so I had to stand fanning the cup for half an hour. Then on another occasion, she ordered me to stand by the pool in the midday heat holding a tray of fruit. Then after each lap, she made me feed her a piece. It's not surprising I ended up with heat stroke and fell into the pool, which must have been extremely funny to Lily. Ugh. Well, she who laughs today may weep tomorrow. The next day, while watering the roses in the backyard, I caught sight of Lily acting out the part of the maid in front of her father through the living room's window. It seemed that she wanted to take the lead role in the movie, too. I think you should just focus on your commercial advertising projects. You haven't learned the lines, and your fake crying is terrible. Do you even know which book this movie is adapted from? Then he just left, leaving her with her tantrum. At that moment, Lily caught me standing there laughing. So, as punishment, she ordered me to clean every single book in the library. Ugh! Whatever. I liked books anyway. Standing on the ladder cleaning, I happened to see the original copy of The Servant, the book the play is based on. I took it off the shelf, when suddenly, the sound of the door opening startled me. I quickly put the book back and tried to climb down the ladder, but then I misplaced my footing and... Ah! Firm hands grabbed my waist and guided me onto my feet. They were wearing a hoodie, mask, and sunglasses. OMG, had a thief just saved me? Who are you? How did you get in? This is trespassing. Do you realize whose house you're trying to rob? And you, do you know who you're talking to? Thief. Ridiculous. Then he pulled down his hood and took off his sunglasses and mask. Oh god... It was Jack Jerome, the hottest actor on the scene right now. Before I could react, Lily's high-pitched scream startled us both. Jack, you're here! It's so exciting that you're staying with us for the next few months. I'm such a huge fan. To Lily's dismay, Jack ignored her, then coldly walked out of the room. So, turns out Jack's been cast as the male lead in The Servant. And to avoid adding to his already scandalous past and thus affecting the movie, Lucas insisted he stay here during filming. Anyway, even though I didn't like Jack at all, at least him being around meant Lily was too busy clinging on to him to pester me. These days, I often take advantage of the late-night cleaning time to study the original book. The last audition is coming up, and I have to understand my character better than anyone else. I was cleaning the kitchen while reading when suddenly I heard footsteps. Hmm, who could it be at this time? So, you like this book? It's confusing though, right? Or are you suggesting a mere maid like me isn't smart enough to understand it? 
I have no idea why you're cast as the warm, kind-natured, sincere part of Alfred. You're clearly the opposite of him. It's called acting, sweetheart. So are you saying an actor must be exactly like their character in real life? Then shouldn't you be more cautious, since I just played a murdering lunatic in my last movie? He's really unpleasant. Arguing with someone as arrogant as him was pointless. I'd just taken a few steps when I slipped over, but Jack reached out and grabbed my shirt tail, which helped save me from falling flat on the ground, but caused my shirt to tear. I blushed in embarrassment and tried to fix it. Here, have this, he said, as he quickly took off his jacket and placed it around my shoulders. At that moment, out of nowhere, Lily appeared. On seeing her, Jack hurriedly left the kitchen. She stormed over to me and yanked his shirt off me. What now? Changing your target already? But let me remind you, you're just some dumb maid. Jack's mine? Oh, poor Lily. You delusional girl. I'm not interested in Jack. But it doesn't take more than a glance to tell he's not remotely interested in her. Because of yesterday's incident... Lily made me wake up at 4 a.m. to bake probably all kinds of cakes that exist on Earth. I'd just finished decorating the last batch when she rushed into the kitchen, snatched the apron and gloves off me, then put them on. I didn't have time to understand what was happening when Jack walked in and she quickly held the plate out to him. Have a bite! I got up early to make it for you. What a fake! Jack was about to pop a piece of cake into his mouth, when I realized it was almond. He's allergic to them. Stop! That cake has almonds in it. Here, have this one. He took the cake, then winked at me before he walked off. Yeah, his personality sucks, but... Oh boy, how to resist that strong jawline and those beautiful deep eyes? Mm. Naturally, Lily was furious, so she forced me to make tea but no matter how much she knocked on Jack's door, he wouldn't open it for her. So she angrily threw the tea tray on the ground and yelled for me to clean it up. Oh my, it was such a mess. The carpet was tea-stained and there were bits of chipped china everywhere. I started picking up the pieces when, ouch, I cut my hand. Jack immediately opened the door. Then on seeing my bleeding hand, he quickly led me into his room and helped me bandage the cut. I didn't know he had this warm side to him. How surprising. This weekend, the director's having a small gathering for the film cast and crew, so my time was taken up with the preparation for this. Now I was confident to say that I had fully understood what it's like to be a servant, there's no housework that I hadn't tried. I also accidentally lied to the housekeeper that I used to be a bartender, so she assigned the cocktail making to me. I was trying to get my head around the recipe of a cosmopolitan, when Jack walked in, pretty good, but perhaps it needs a little more cranberry juice. You want the merry, not passing out. <laughs> I know all the guests coming, so I can give you hints on what cocktails to serve them. That's a good thing. I could ask him more about my future co-stars. The two of us talked passionately about wine, cocktails, and the servant book. Hmm, turns out he's actually quite sweet, and nothing at all like those ego-driven swine the press portray him as. While talking and drinking, I felt a little dizzy. Suddenly, Jack approached me. Actually, I find you quite captivating, so you can quit playing around now. Playing around? Huh? You think I like you? You're drunk. I was about to leave when Jack stopped me. You're always falling over in front of me. You remember my almond allergy? You're reading the book I'm cast as the lead in. If you don't like me... How come you've been with me this whole time? I looked at Jack confused. Honestly, every time I faced him, I felt my heart skip. Seeing me blushing, Jack gently lifted my chin and placed a sweet kiss on my lips. Right then, a scream made me jump and almost fell over again. Ah! What on earth are you two doing? I frantically ran out of the kitchen leaving Lily screaming behind me. I sat outside by the pool until I regained my composure. That was unexpected. My first kiss was with Jack, the scandalous actor I hated the most. Hmm, 
I think I needed to leave before things became even more complicated. After composing myself, I went back to my room to start packing and saw my clothes were thrown across the ground and there, sitting on my bed with a smug look on her face, was Lily. She waved my passport and script in her hand. Jenny Sinclair, it appears I know your secret. How humble of you to lower yourself to play a maid just to get a movie role. Imagine the scandal if the press found out about this. No one would dare to cooperate with a snake like you. I angrily grabbed my things back, but it didn't work. Lily even pulled out her phone to film and threaten me. Do what I say, else this video goes viral. Then not only will your daddy dearest know you've been scrubbing toilets all day, but imagine the damage your lies will do to his precious reputation. Gah! She was messing with the wrong girl. My method acting experience was over. I was done being her puppet. It's time she realized who's the true master of this game. Oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? According to the poet, this world and all existing life is an illusion of sorts. As reality doesn't exist, philosophers refer to it as dream argument and dream hypothesis. What? What an interesting lesson! By the way, look at how there's a ray of sunshine coming through the curtains. That's so pretty. This kind of weather indeed puts you in such a dreamy mood, huh? Yeah, right. But remember, there is no rose without thorns. That sunshine may look glorious, but it will harm your eyes. Yeah, I know. The maids always tell me that sunlight is the enemy for me, for my beautiful, sensitive blue eyes. Looking at it once, and I'll never be able to see anything again. That's why I've never been allowed to leave this castle. My maids all look identical in those masks, don't they? When I was a child, of course, I once got curious, and I pulled one of them off. As punishment, I was denied dessert for a whole week. And worse still, it wasn't worth it, as the maid's face was exceedingly ordinary. The masks looked far better. Anyway, I suppose all that matters is that they take great care of me. Each day they bring me food, water, and new clothes. I was sipping my leek and potato soup when I heard a scream. Let me out! Curious, I went and hid in a corner and saw two maids attempting to lock the screaming girl into a room. Hmm, I've never seen that girl in this castle before. I wonder if she's from the outside world. Poor her. It looks like she can't control herself. The world out there is scary. Perhaps it has sent her into madness. It's much safer here in the castle. I can play all day, paint, knit, and read. Oh, how peaceful. Hmm but I still couldn't stop thinking about that poor girl. I wonder what will happen to her. The screaming didn't stop, and my curiosity got the best of me, so I snuck into the girl's room. Shh, stop screaming. No one is listening. Uh, who are you? Uh, um, my name is Mistress. What's yours? <laughs> Mistress isn't a name. Are you stupid? It's just a name. Everybody here calls me that. This girl was so stubborn. She seemed to be wary of everything. Poor little outside world girl. After much persistence, she told me that her name was Nora. I was about to ask her why she was here, when suddenly two maids appeared and dragged me away. Mistress, you should not interact with this wicked girl. And you mustn't be late for your embroidery class. <sighs> It was nice to finally get to talk to a girl my own age, and I must admit that given her brash nature, I found Nora rather interesting. During class, I kept thinking about how I could sneak out and see her again. Ah! Ouch! That annoying girl screaming made me prick my finger. I ran out to check on her, but the maids immediately blocked my way. Perhaps I could talk some sense into her. Trust me, the last time I spoke to her, she was acting totally normal. 
The desperate maids exchanged looks. Then let me go to her. As predicted, when I approached Nora, she stopped screaming. Hey, it's Ariana. That's my real name. Screaming never works here. Just pretend you're listening to my words, then I'll help you out. The maids were quite surprised when Nora immediately calmed herself down and showed signs of following directions, so they let us be and left. We began to chat, and ever since then, the maids let me see Nora every day. She told me how before her mother died, she gave Nora an address to find her biological father, who she'd never met before. Nora's grandma helped her set up a meeting with him and took her to the meeting point. She was so nervous, but happy at the same time to finally meet her dad. And at first, he was as kind and charming as she imagined. But then unexpectedly, right after they said goodbye to her grandma, he brought Nora here and let those masked people lock her up. But you're fortunate to be here, as it's safe. No, it's not. That's just what they want you to believe. Then Nora told me about the outside world, about her friends, school, and shopping malls. Every day, she even drew me paintings of the outside world, of beautiful memories with her family, her mom who passed away, and also her dad, even though she only met him once. Family? What is that? All I'd ever known were the faceless maids. The next day when I visited Nora as usual, she suddenly told me, Sis, we need to get out of here. What do you mean? This is my home. No, it's not. It's a prison. Who on earth stays inside for 14 years, huh? It's because of my eyes. I'll go blind if I go out there. My maids only want the best for me. That's why they keep me here. Are you crazy? You've been tricked. Just think about it. Do you know who gave birth to you? And why did that person leave you with these people? Or are these people the ones who took you away from your mom? Don't you want to find out the truth? This was my home, wasn't it? But thinking about what Nora just said, as well as the outside world that she rambled about every day, I suppose it would be interesting to experience it for myself. I just have to try my best to protect my eyes. So... I snuck into the housekeeper's room and stole the front door key. As we approached the main hall leading to the door, we saw a masked woman standing by a man. In his arms was a young girl, deep asleep. Huh? huh? Th that's my dad. What? Did he come to pick you up or something? Don't you see that they're all in the same boat? And she's the ringleader. I peered closer at them and spotted the masked woman's silver hair and luxurious dress. Isn't that my tester? She lives in the grand suite and visits me weekly to assess my learning and etiquette. Mom, how are you going to handle this case? Just leave her in the empty room at the end of the hallway. As for Nora, I think she'll settle in properly in a week or so. Then we can start her etiquette and culture lessons. Which Nora? Ah, uh, I remember. Besides, you should restrict yourself a bit. Ariana, Nora, and now this child? Don't let the list of your illegitimate children be as long as your arm. Then you can just throw them away somewhere. Why bother raising them? They are my grandchildren, after all. They can't end up like those street rats. And who knows? They may become useful. But this has to be the last one. We can't risk Laura finding out about us. It would ruin our family's affluent name. Do you understand? I know, but fear not, as my wife is kind and foolish. She is completely clueless to these matters, thanks to your smart move. So, we were this heartless man's illegitimate children? And because of his deceit, he was forcing us to live in darkness? I don't want to be locked up and lied to any longer. We needed to escape. From then on, Nora kept her act up and behaved like an angel, which eventually led to us being allowed to study together. And today is the day. Oriana is having a convulsion. We must take her to the hospital as soon as possible. 
However, the maids called the doctor to come round here instead. Oh, no! The plan was to escape when we were taken outside. If the doctor came here, he'd discover that my rashes were painted on and our plan would be disclosed. Okay, plan B. I was still lying on the bed playing the whole role of a patient while Nora locked the door of the room and went to the bathroom screaming. Help! There's a giant spider in here! As expected, the doctor went to check. Then Nora immediately locked him in. Then we quickly took the knotted string made of the fabrics and embroidery class out from under the bed and then escaped through the window. Ah! I got my head between my hands as soon as I landed. I didn't expect it to be so bright outside. It's burning my eyes, Nora! What? There's no time for your hysterics. You'll be done if you're stuck here anyway. Just open your eyes and run! Hurry up! But I'm scared! Huh? Nothing happened. My eyes seemed fine. But no time to celebrate as then I saw... Oh my god. A couple of maids were chasing after me. Nora pulled my hand and ran towards the garden. Fortunately, we were already out of their sight when... Woof! Woof! A huge hound appeared out of nowhere and growled at us. I crouched down in a bush and watched Nora wave the dog closer. And then pat him. What? Magic! The dog suddenly became unusually obedient and led us to a secret place. A dog-sized passageway! I hesitated, but seeing the maids gaining on us, I reluctantly squeezed through it real quick. I can't believe I'm putting my destiny in the hands of this reckless girl! She said we had to get to her grandmother's house right away for help. What are those things running back and forth on the road? Why are they making that loud, annoying noise? Hmm. And why is Nora waving her arms about? Did she want them to stop? Too bad nobody did, as she's no princess. We kept wandering until we saw something which Nora called a truck parked on the roadside. She rushed over, then helped me onto the back of it. Oh, it was full of bananas. I stuffed my mouth full of them to ward off my starvation, while the scenery kept changing. That thing stopped, and we immediately got off before getting caught. I held her tight, frightened of all the people around us. They kept staring at me. And what kind of style was that? They all looked very peculiar. Maybe they were just commoners. Then we used our power to demand a man to take us to Nora's grandma's. Oh, it was exhausting. What? The outside is actually beautiful, sparkling with all those lights. And there are exhibitions of everything in the world, such as food, toys, flowers, and even creatures. Yes, everything. But the most important thing was that my eyes didn't get sore looking at those shiny things at all. Nora's grandma seems kind, but her home is full of the strangest of items. While Nora told her what had happened, I found myself bewitched by the talking black box on the wall. Suddenly, Nora's grandma led us to her far smaller truck and took us to somewhere called the Cops. They all wore these same funny outfits and bombarded us with dozens of confusing questions. And what exactly is an ID card? A few days later, there was news that the Cops had caught my so-called dad, grandma, and maids also. As predicted, he was a womanizer, so when his lovers asked him to support his children, he was so afraid that his wife would find out that he took these children and locked them away in the castle. They're currently awaiting something called a trial, which Nora says is where bad people get their comeuppance. Whoa, the world outside is so busy. I didn't realize there'd be so many unmasked faces. And that strange talking box still startles me, especially when someone is holding a weapon. Nora says when I've adjusted to my new life a little more, I'll start school with her. And one day I'll even learn how to drive one of those smaller trucks. But firstly, she's teaching me how to dress like other people do. And use this brick to communicate with them. This world is puzzling. But I'm sure with Nora's help, I'll soon find my feet.
even if it's just so I can learn how to reply to my dashing neighbor. Long idling hours in class finally came to an end. Time to go home and chill. Huh? Are those thugs threatening a girl? Picking on the weak? Such cowards. Oops, she saw me. Now they're all looking at me. As a Muay Thai prodigy, I most definitely will run as fast as I can from danger. It's not me. My legs have a mind of their own. Besides, I stood no chance against those big, scary guys. I might get myself hurt if I tried to help. Then she'd call me a jumpy idiot. Yet some part of me still wished I could do something. While I was pondering from afar, a guy charged at them out of nowhere, then knocked them all out. Looked like he knew martial arts. Like me. I'm Jamie, by the way, and my story's absolutely normal. Please like and subscribe. I didn't expect to see my dad home this early. Sweetie, you're back already. How's your day? Hi, Dad. All good. It's been just me and my dad since my mom passed away when I was little. He's the best dad I could ask for, but he's shunned by this entire town. He's one of the firefighters who reported to a tragic fire accident around a year ago. They managed to save many lives, but unfortunately there were casualties. After that, the fire department became the town's scapegoat just because they couldn't save everyone. However, I could see better than anyone how much my father had sacrificed. He always covered up his left arm and told me not to tell anybody about it. He considered it part of his job and still felt guilty about that tragedy. More importantly, he taught me to be willing to help others no matter what. Little Jamie did listen to him and was always helpful, but no matter how hard we tried, we still had to endure the townsfolk's woulda, coulda, shoulda nonsense. So I now live by my own rule. Don't be a hero. Hey, it helped Jesse Eisenberg's character survive zombie land, so it'd surely get me through my life. And so the happy little girl now wears a permanent scowl on her face like her armor. Thanks to my tough exterior, no one would ever pick a fight with me or speak badly about me, at least not to my face. Side effects included having no friends, getting pushed around by teachers, and being brushed off most of the time. You know, the usual cold shoulder. The next day, I was enjoying a good old boring normal day when I suddenly was summoned to the principal's office. For bullying a fellow student? What? Turns out, the damsel in distress yesterday, Betty, reported everything to the principal while conveniently placing me in that gang. I tried explaining myself, but my efforts seemed to be futile. Can't say I'm surprised. Like father, like daughter, I am seriously concerned about my students' safety, especially since street violence reigns in this area lately. Such terrible behavior is even more serious coming from you than those imbeciles. Good heavens, I hadn't even touched a single strand of hair on anyone's head. Oof, she obviously is blaming me simply because I didn't help. But speaking the truth would be like adding fuel to the fire. I believe the proper punishment for you is immediate suspension for two weeks. No, sir, I can't be their accomplice because... Because I was going to start a self-defense club for girls. Just like you, I worry a great deal about multiple attacks recently. Therefore, I want to help them be prepared. I I was trying to recruit Betty, but she was surrounded by so many of them while I was all alone. That's like fighting a losing battle. I actually ran away so I could, um, report them to you. Betty must have mistaken me for one of them. My gibberish speech went on for a good while before he finally let me go. I had to bluff my way through as many questions. Where does the club take place? When? How many members? And since he said he'd come by sometimes, I actually had to create a self-defense club and begin recruiting. The first day of the club, only a few girls came. Fine, I don't have much care for this stuff anyway. It's merely an excuse for me to be let off the hook. I grabbed the two tallest girls, then asked them to demonstrate a couple moves so the rest could follow their lead. When an assailant strikes, cross your wrist to trap his arms. Jump and boom! Boom. Yeah, boom. Did I do that right, Jamie? Jamie? Yes, yes, uh, that's it. Uh, don't be lazy, okay? Then I got back to scrolling on my phone and saw that Betty had gone public about the incident. Even someone as indifferent as me could see how much sympathy and attention Betty got after that. Her story's influence went beyond the internet when our school launched a No Bullies Allowed campaign and chose her to be the spokesperson. However, they could only propose outdated and ineffective measures, like always traveling in groups, bringing pocket knives or pepper spray, or giving in to not get any serious injury. None of which really helped, and more students fell victim. A few days later, right before English class, I saw the Good Samaritan that day. He's Aaron and transferred from another school in the area. Come to think of it, he's quite a heartthrob, which got all the girls all riled up. Do you have a girlfriend? What's your type? Sexy, cool, nerdy. I know, nice and sweet? Yes, yes. Oh, Mr. Bernardi's here. 
As usual, Mr. Bernardi began the lesson with a pop quiz. Today's topic was Hamlet. Okay, I knew this one. What's the play about, Teddy? Um, uh, a guy named Hamlet? Good, B+. Plus. Any other idea? Jamie? The play works on many levels. It's about Prince Hamlet's family conflict, their politics, how he can't make up his mind about duties, moral codes, and... Stop! F. You're reading too much into it. Well, I should have seen that coming. You suck. What did you say, Aaron Taylor? I said, aw, shucks. Wow, this guy's so much more than just a pretty face. When class was over, I came to thank him and even got his socials. He's a super handsome guy with a voice of an angel who defended me. I think I got, well, you know. Hmm, let's see what his social says about his type. Oh, Betty seemed to be getting more and more support, huh? I guess people have more compassion for delicate little flowers like her. <sighs> wow, nice. I had zero chance then. Suddenly, I heard a commotion outside, then peeked out to see my father dealing with rude neighbors. Man, I can't live the life of the local doormat anymore. If so, I had to change first. I can be like her. All right, starting today, call me Dainty Jamie. Ugh, I'll figure something out, but my life will surely be different. Aaron, your girlfriend is coming. I'll certainly need a new look to go with my new personality. The princess diary would be the perfect tutorial. First, I have to look like a princess. So I replaced my sneakers, hoodies, and t-shirts with high heels, short skirts, and all things pink and glittery. Of course, cute accessories are a must. Ting! But it would be lying if I said this new style was comfy. This morning, my long hair got caught in a keychain on my backpack. It was impossible to untangle, so I had to cut off a chunk of hair. You know what they say, pain is beauty. I went to school in my new style, and the moment I set foot in the building, people stared at me like I was an alien. Then the mocking began. Look who's talking! Last time I saw something like you, I flushed. Oh dear, that wasn't very ladylike. So I decided to change my tone to sound posh and even learned how to sit, stand, and pick up dropped items elegantly. Greetings, Mrs. Allen. Can I have mashed potatoes and beans, please? What's that? Speak up, young lady. I'm sorry. Can someone be a doll and help, please? But they just looked at me all judgy. <sighs> Stay calm. A lady doesn't panic. I slowly sat down with poise, but someone already picked up my tray. Aaron! He's freaky fast. Being a helpless pretty girl sure is nice. Jamie, you look different. <laughs> I've always looked like this, silly. Since then, we started having lunch together. I felt safe around him because he's new here and didn't know about my past. We gradually became close as we've had many things in common, like martial arts. I really wanted to let my geek flag fly high, but had to hold back. Still, it didn't mean he's used to the current me. Like, he'd not understand that I was trying to eat gracefully. Are you a slow eater or just picky? Give it to me. I was saving it for last. Also, he often brought me honey and lemon candy. Sweet! But that's because he thought my soft voice came from a sore throat. Erin, I was looking for you everywhere. Come, I want to show you something cool. Uh, we're kinda in the middle of something. Why are you always with her? Let me tell you, her father- Come here, you have to see this. What is it? Uh, well, um, flowers. Yeah, flowers. Aren't they pretty? You're weird. Like, in a good way. But weird. <laughs> Are you trying to hide an earth-shattering secret, like your true self? Am I wrong? No way. What else can I be but myself? You watch too many movies. <laughs> to keep up my fair lady appearance, I shouldn't come to the fight girl club so frequently. Since the principal wasn't breathing down my neck anymore, I hadn't been there for the past two weeks. Meanwhile, I tried to talk to Aaron more often. He's very nice. A bit too nice, as in he literally took pleasure in helping others. Today, although we're supposed to walk home together, Aaron cancelled at the last minute cause... So sorry. Betty needed someone to walk her home, and today none of her friends could. How are you always in the mood to help people? Don't know. It's fun, I guess. Aren't you afraid your kindness will be taken for granted, or getting you into trouble one day? Like my... well, never mind. Have fun. I'll make it up to you. Bye. I'm fine with that. It just stings because it's Betty. Actually, Aaron wouldn't think twice about assisting a complete stranger, let alone a classmate. Was I even a little bit special in his eyes? I want to come clean to him, yet I'm afraid that will only make him distrust me and leave me like everybody else. This uncertain hell is driving me insane. I'll ask him out to clear things up. Ugh, just a dumb text from my self-defense club. Delete. Eek. He said yes. That's a good sign. 
Sunday came, and after we bought our tickets, we saw a girl struggling with dozens of grocery bags. Oh, that's Pooja from school. Erin hurried over to help with the bags. We had some time before the movie started. We walked her back and found out that she's volunteering at a soup kitchen for homeless people. Thanks so much. You two are here anyway. Want to join us? We always need some help here. What? Free labor? No, Absolutely, we're no sorry. problem. We got tickets to a movie, right, Aaron? I don't think it's too late to change our plan, though. I had to pull him aside immediately. Aaron, what if we're too helpful so they keep us here until late? If not, we'll get yelled at. And if we leave early, they'll have something else to say. I don't know. Maybe this isn't a good idea. Come now. So complicated. Just flat out say you don't want to help. Don't be ridiculous. It's our date, and we shouldn't let it go to waste. I'm ridiculous? Okay, but at least I'm not selfish and conceited. You don't want to feed the homeless? I'll stay and give them a hand. You can leave. Hey, what's the matter with you? Don't think you're better because you help everyone you see. Oh, so now we're being honest? Fine, my turn. I didn't listen to what everyone said about you and still became your friend. Turns out they're all right after all. Like father, like daughter. What are you talking about? You... You you knew everything? Yeah, I'm not dumb, and that's not all. Now I finally believe my dad died in that fire because of your dad's negligence. Then he stormed off, leaving me stunned. I could see he rolled up his sleeves and began happily working, while I was left out here with my heart broken. Hi, I'm Viola, and today is a big day. You see, it's my first time ever acting in this awesome short film, but I can't seem to focus at all. Why, you ask? Well, that's because I just discovered I'm not real. Or, to be exact, I only exist in my best friend's imagination. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Until yesterday, I always thought of myself as a completely normal human being. <sighs> Let me tell you how it all started. The first memory I have involves my best friend Harlow. I woke up feeling dazed and confused and saw this pretty girl smiling down at me. She told me that I'd be safe now and that her parents were going to look after me. Strangely, I couldn't remember anything before that day, and no one told me what had happened. I could only guess that I'd probably been abandoned or something, and that Harlow and her parents were my saviors. So, from then on, I lived with Harlow's family, who showed me kindness and love. When I first got out of the hospital, I couldn't do anything by myself. From personal things like brushing my teeth and washing my face, to chores such as doing laundry and dumping the trash. At the time, it was Harlow who guided and helped me, like a caring big sister. Then, when we entered middle school and the boys started flirting with me, Harlow was always by my side to protect me. She told me how they would never like a plain, boring girl like me, and that they were only doing this to get close to her as she was very beautiful. If I had a decision to make, big or small, I always consulted Harlow first, as I knew she'd know best. But recently, I noticed that Harlow was acting short-tempered with me. When I got a better grade on my English essay than her, she told me I only got that mark as the teacher just felt sorry for me. Then she stormed off. Man, I didn't mean to upset her, and it was really unfair that the teacher didn't give her the grade she deserved, as she's far smarter than I am. Then last week, this boy called Hank in our school's film club held open auditions for his short film project. Harlow was desperate to be in it, so I decided to go along with her for support. I thought Harlow's audition was marvelous, but for some reason, she wasn't picked. I was about to leave too, but then Hank asked me if I wanted to audition. So I did, and you know what? I got the lead role. I was so surprised, and so was Harlow. She insisted that they were just tricking me and I shouldn't take the part, as why would they choose a girl with ordinary looks like me to play the female lead? But still, I wanted to give it a try. Opportunities like this don't come twice, right? So I accepted the part. I know Harlow was worried that they were just teasing me, but Hank and his crew seemed nice. And maybe he finds my normal look suitable for the character, right? The morning before the shooting day, I asked Harlow to lend me her pretty white dress to wear to the shoot. Harlow looked annoyed as she said, You spilled coffee on that dress last time you borrowed it, remember? You didn't even bother taking care of it, and now the stain's still there. No way! I remember washing it before returning it to you. Well, then you remember it wrong. It's my dress, so I'm hardly going to forget what you did to it, am I? Then she left in a temper. Strange. I remember using vinegar to clean the coffee stains, 
as it took me ages to scrub it off. But it is true that my memory isn't all that good. When I was a child, I once waited in the park in the rain for over an hour, just because I thought Harlow told me to meet her there on Saturday afternoon. I said Sunday afternoon. I have piano practice today, silly. So maybe I misremembered again and really didn't wash the dress for her? That day in math class, Harlow got caught texting, so the teacher confiscated her phone. At break time, she asked me to sneak into the school administrator's room to get her phone back. But of course I refused, as I was far too scared to do that kind of stuff. It's okay, no one can see you. Basically because you only exist in my imagination. What was she talking about? What did she mean by that? For the rest of the lesson, I kept thinking about Harlow's words. When the bell rang, seeing that I was still confused, Harlow pointed to a group of students standing nearby and told me that no matter what I did, they wouldn't see me. And that's true! When I waved my hands and talked to them, no one looked in my direction. I even snapped my fingers in front of them, but they didn't react at all. What is going on? Harlow told me that because she imagined me, she's in control of who sees me or not. Then she told me that if I still didn't believe it, I should go to the school administrator's room to get her phone. Then I'd see that she was telling the truth. The superintendent was standing right across the hallway, but Harlow assured me I'd be invisible to her. My heart was thudding like crazy, but I tried to shake back my nerves and continued to get her phone undetected. Whoa, the superintendent didn't see me at all. So what Harlow said was true? I only existed in her imagination? That means... Harlow's really the one who decides what will happen to me. And who I'll meet? So basically the author of my life story. But does that also mean that I have no control over my own life? Well, if I even have a life. Then Harlow barged into my room and said, You've never wondered why you don't remember anything about your parents and about the time before you met me, have you? It was because I lost my memory after the accident. There was no accident, Viola. You have no previous memories because that was when I created you, as I wanted a friend to play with. I kept this truth a secret because I love you, and you always listen to me. But you've been so headstrong lately. After Harlow left, I found myself feeling so down. It turned out my whole life had never belonged to me. No wonder I was so plain and ordinary. All I am is a side character in Harlow's story. After a horrible, sleepless night, I didn't even feel like going to the film set anymore. And it's already late anyway. I was laying in bed, spacing out, when Hank phoned me asking where I was. I only exist in Harlow's imagination, so there's no point filming. Huh? What nonsense are you going on about? Stop joking, Viola. We're short on time over here. Seeing that I didn't even bother to reply to him but just let out a long sigh, he continued. All right then, if that's the case, then you should at least make it count. Would you like to imagine yourself as just a boring nobody or a brilliant actress? I suppose Hank's words made sense, so I got myself back together and hurried to the film set. Even if I'm imaginary, I'll make this unreal life of mine unimaginably awesome. The filming was actually a lot of fun, and everyone complimented my acting. Hmm, they were probably just being nice, but it still felt good. Then Hank came over and congratulated me. Now that filming's over, you can be honest with me. I don't mind. I know you only cast me as the lead as you like Harlow. What do you mean? And the thing you said this morning as well about only existing in Harlow's imagination? I ended up blurting out everything to him, and you know what he did? He laughed. But when he saw that I was struggling to fight back my tears, he took my hand. Viola, listen to me. Harlow's tricking you. The only thing not real in all of this are her words, not you. No way. Harlow's my best friend. She would never do such a thing. If you only existed in Harlow's imagination, how come you still decided, on your own, to show up at film set this morning? How come you still meet other people without her being around? Like... Right now. Harlow couldn't have written the script with all these little details, right? Come on, Vi. Think about it. 
but there was a time when Harlow made me invisible to everybody else. I snapped my fingers in front of them, and they didn't react at all. Hank asked me who these people were, and I told him. He said he'd make sure I saw sense. Then he left. This was so confusing. I cannot tell what is real and what's not anymore. The next day at school, when I was sorting my locker out, Hank dragged a reluctant-looking boy over to me. I recognized him. He was part of the group who didn't see me. Go on, tell her everything. The boy told me how Harlow had bribed them to trick me. He also said that they distracted the superintendent so I could sneak into her office without being caught. What? I didn't understand why Harlow would do this to me. Hank went with me to confront her, and she faked a smile and said, Silly Viola, it was just a joke. So what about the fact that I can't remember anything about the time before I met you? You said there was no accident. It's also a lie, isn't it? I never said that. Probably you misremembered again like so many times before. I view you as a sister, Viola. I'd never lie to you. I didn't know what to believe anymore. I needed to be alone for a minute. This was all too much to process. So I ran to the nearby park to clear my mind. Suddenly, I felt something cold next to my cheek. It was Hank. He passed me some water and told me to drink it and calm down. Viola, I think Harlow's gaslighting you. She's basically emotionally abusing you to make you question your own sanity. I know you see her as a sister, but she's really toxic. Could it? Could it be possible that Harlow didn't have my best interests at heart? But what did she even get out of this, though? I'm not sure if this was because she wanted me to rely on her or she's jealous. But either way, knowing she could deceive me like that hurt like crazy. I didn't want to believe that that was what had been happening. But after all explanations, it's so clear now that Harlow was gaslighting me. And ever since then, I tried to avoid her as much as possible. But this was tricky, seeing as we were in the same class and lived together. I just wished I could grow up fast, so I could go to college and leave this house. At least there was good news. Hank's film in which I starred had gained attention on YouTube, and he was even selected to attend the short film festival with a view to supporting the city's young, talented filmmakers. Then, one day, I arrived home from school to see Harlow's parents drinking coffee with a strange woman. Huh? She sure looked a lot like me. Suddenly, she was running over to me and hugging me in her arms. Oh, darling, you have no idea how long I've been waiting for this moment. Following a whole lot of confusion, shocking revelations, and emotions, I finally found out the actual truth. It turned out that when I was seven years old, Mom took me on a yacht trip. Only, there was a terrible accident, so we took the lifeboat to shore. But then Mom fell out and ended up being rescued by another boat. We both suffered memory loss. In fact, Mom only remembered who I was when she saw the short film I starred in on YouTube. And then she tracked me down here. After that, I returned to live with my real mom. And guess what? I now realize just how awesome I am. I'm grateful to Harlow's parents for looking after me, but I still haven't forgiven Harlow yet. I'm trying to, as I know she's not all bad, but it's going to take some time. I also feel so blessed to have Hank by my side to help me discover my confidence and value my own worth. He even says I can be in his next film project, which I'm really excited about. It's good to know that I'm actually real, and I exist outside of Harlow's mind. The world is mine for the taking. And who knows, maybe one day I'll end up being a professional actress. Finally, after an 11-hour flight, I arrived at LAX, Los Angeles International Airport. It's awesome! I can't wait to see my mom. You see, my dad's French and my mom's American. We used to all live together in France, but then they split up and mom moved back here. Of course, I've talked to her on FaceTime and stuff, but this will be the first time I've properly seen her in five years. I haven't visited before because mom's a super successful businesswoman and she works really hard. That meant she wouldn't have the time to provide me with the attention I needed. But now that I'm 16 and I can look after myself, I'm finally able to visit. 
So thanks to my dad and stepmom for my plane ticket birthday present, I'm now in sunny LA for a whole month. Not only do I get to spend time with mom, but I also get to chill out in her enormous villa. Ah, <sighs> bliss. But first, let's get all my luggage, then find a taxi to my mom's. Yeah, unfortunately, she couldn't come to pick me up since she had some work to do. But no problem, I can handle this myself. Okay, maybe I spoke too soon. It's been half an hour and my luggage was nowhere to be seen. Then, this handsome guy approached me and said, Hey, looks like your luggage has gone AWOL. Do you need any help? Cute and helpful. Hmm, I could totally get used to US guys. I showed him my ticket, and turns out, I was waiting at the wrong carousel. Oops. After guiding me to the correct one, this guy, whose name I found out was Zach, even pulled my luggage down for me. But one of my cases got stuck and burst open, causing everything to tumble out. Girl, it's not your lucky day, is it? He burst out laughing. Oh well, at least it wasn't all bad. I mean, a cute guy had rescued me, right? He helped me pick up my things, then he offered to drive me to my mom's house. After some 30 minutes, he began to slow down. I looked out the window and, oh my god, this is the chicest villa ever. The pool, the tennis court, the palm trees. It was exactly like a movie star home. I was gawping at the villa when suddenly I heard a car engine sound. Startled, I turned around to see Zach zooming away. My suitcases! I yelled. Ugh, my laptop and iPad were in there too. Oh God, why is this happening to me? And on my very first day in the US? At least I still had my phone and passport with me. Phew. So I called my mom. Needless to say, I was a distraught mess when she arrived. Who'd have thought that such a kind-looking guy would turn out to be a thief? Anyways, my mom could buy me new clothes and things, and I could still have an amazing time in her villa, right? Mom led me to my room and told me to get some rest. After that disaster, I was dead exhausted, so I quickly fell asleep on the comfiest bed ever. When I awoke, it was dark outside. I realized I hadn't eaten anything since the flight, so I went downstairs and checked the fridge and cupboards. Huh? They were all empty. I was still digging around in the kitchen when my mom returned with some burgers. Sweetie, I only got back from my business trip yesterday, so I haven't had time to go to the grocery store. Let's just eat fast food today, okay? I didn't mind, as it was awesome to have dinner with my mom again after such a long time. I took a look around the room. There was barely any furniture here. My mom said that's minimalism, a trendy lifestyle in LA nowadays. Less is more. How cool is that? The next morning we went out, but what's with that old rusty car? Seeing my confused look, she quickly explained that this was only temporary as her car was being serviced. But then mom couldn't get the garage door to open. Turns out, normally she had her own chauffeur. But since I've traveled thousands of miles to visit her, she wanted to drive herself. Huh, how sweet. In the following days, my mom and I enjoyed ourselves in LA. Sunbathing by the pool, spa days, shopping. This is definitely the best vacation of my life. At least until that morning, I was awoken by a loud quarrel. Looking down from the stairs, I saw mom in the living room with a strange woman. She was pointing at the couch. Geez, that's where I spilled soy sauce yesterday while eating sushi. Then mom appeared and sounded flustered. She told me to quickly pack my things as we were leaving. Um, mom, is there something wrong? Oh, nothing, sweetie. It's just that the couch is dirty, so let's just get someone in to clean the entire villa. Wow, mom would deep clean the whole house just because of a soy sauce stain? How rich is she? So... Where will we stay this time? A luxurious five-star hotel? Or a magnificent mansion in Beverly Hills? <sighs> but then the car came to a stop in front of some shabby apartment building. Huh? This couldn't be right. Mom told me this was her friend's spare apartment, so we would stay here a few days for convenience. Elena, it's probably best if you stay away from the people in this area. 
They don't have the same lifestyle as us. You know what I mean. Ugh. Yeah, this place was the opposite of the villa. Cramped room, hard bed, and the bathroom didn't even have a bathtub. Since moving here, Mom didn't take me out anymore. In the evenings, she dressed up all elegantly and went out to her fancy work meetings. On one such evening, I was sitting alone watching YouTube, munching on french fries for the fifth time this week, when there was a knock on the door. I opened it, and standing there was a scruffy guy, claiming to be Frankie, the landlord's son. I told him there must be a mistake, as we were only here for a few days. Then I went to close the door, but he blocked it with his foot. Miss Anita has rented this apartment for two years. What do you mean a few days? I just saw her take a cab at the front door. Don't lie to me. No, my mom is a successful businesswoman who has a villa in Brentwood Park. Then you must have mistaken your mom for someone else. In short, remind your businesswoman mom to pay the rent. Then he sneered and walked away. How dare he say that? And why did I keep on running into jerks? Ugh! When mom returned, I told her what had happened. I thought she'd find it funny or something, but... Nope. Instead, she got really mad. You shouldn't have opened the door to him. I told you not to socialize with the people here. Okay, hearing made-up lies about yourself like that must suck, but did she have to be so furious about it? The next morning, I was drinking tea on the balcony when suddenly I saw a familiar face passing by down the street. My god, it was the jerk from the airport. Zack! That thief! I shouted, rushing down, but when I got there, he disappeared. I was still exasperated when a voice came from behind. What on earth are you doing screaming this early in the morning? I turned around to see Frankie leaning against the wall with his arms folded. None of your business, swindler. Huh? Swindler? What do you mean? Quit lying. I already told my mom all about you trying to con money out of me. Hmm, is that so? So, you think I'm the liar? Before I could answer that provoking question, I heard my mom's voice calling down from the balcony. Hey, rich girl, if you want a reality check, I suggest you come meet me tonight, and we'll go follow your mom. Mom appeared and, frowning, asked me why I was talking to Frankie. I blurted out something about asking for directions, then quickly entered the room and closed the door. Frankie was clearly a thieving, lying jerk, right? But then, why were his words lingering in my mind? I had noticed a few strange things, such as when we were at the villa, I asked mom where the cutlery was, but she couldn't remember. But then in this apartment, she immediately got it. Plus, why was there a photo of her in the bedroom when this was her friend's place? That night, when mom was getting ready to go out again, I spotted her necklace. Only, it was actually my necklace. The one that had been stolen along with the rest of my stuff. My dad got that necklace custom made just for me, so it was a one of a kind, but why did mom have it? I complimented her on it and asked her where she'd got it from. Blushing, she excitedly told me that this rich man she'd just started dating had bought it for her. Then she said he was taking her for dinner tonight. I forced a smile, but... My head was filled with questions. Who really was... Mom? I secretly followed my mom down the street. Suddenly, a hand patted my shoulder. Let's go. I turned around and it was Frankie. Without saying anything, I nodded and quickly got into his car. And we followed mom's taxi. Hold on. Isn't that the villa we stayed in before? After a while, a luxury car arrived, taking my mom to a nearby expensive restaurant. We peered through the glass wall. There she was. My mom was sitting there, smiling and talking with some man in a suit. Was she pretending to live in that villa to trick that man? Was my mom a gold digger? I couldn't watch any more of this, so I pulled on Frankie's arm. But weirdly, he seemed to be as shocked as I was. Um, wasn't this your idea? So why the pale face? He just shook his head and took me home. We waited in the apartment for Mom to return, and oh boy, it was tense. Around midnight, we heard the door open, and Mom walked in and looked at us in alarm. 
She started shooing Frankie out of there, but I interrupted her. Mom, I know everything. You've lived here for two years. You're poor, and you scam rich men. Sweetie, it's not like that. Please calm down and I'll explain everything to you. So, it turns out, after divorcing my dad, she was determined to go back to the U.S. and succeed at business. But she failed, and she was so embarrassed, she lied to me and dad. Then when she heard that I was coming to visit, she spent the little savings she had on renting a swanky villa for me. But when I accidentally spilled soy sauce on that expensive couch, she couldn't afford to fix it. So we were kicked out. As for the man I was with tonight, I ran into him while walking outside the villa. He's rich and nice. He likes me and I like him too. But what about that necklace? Mom, it's actually mine. It was in my stolen suitcase. My mom gave me a confused look. But before she could say anything, Frankie blurted out, That man's a fraud. Mom and I gaped at Frankie as he turned to me and said, I'm sorry, but I think you guys need to know the truth. Then Frankie told us how that man was none other than Zack's dad. After taking me back to the villa, Zack figured my mom was rich, so he persuaded his dad to come and flirt with her. But how did you dig up the dirt on these guys? Because I know Zack. When I saw Lana chasing him, I knew he'd stolen from her. But he's my friend. Great! So you've both been lying to me! Then I rushed into my room, locked the door, and burst into tears. The next morning, Mom knocked on my door, but I ignored her. Elena, I get that you're upset with me, but I've left a sandwich here, so please at least eat something. I'm really sorry. Just wanted to be the perfect mother for you. Her words caused me to sob all over again. But I can say, from the bottom of my heart, I feel sorry for her. After that, I opened the door and hugged her tightly, and then we both blubbered into each other's arms. I'm leaving L.A. today, with Mum. She's moving back to France with me, where she can start afresh. While I was dragging my suitcase to the taxi, Frankie appeared and apologized to me. I just shrugged and told him it didn't matter anymore. I mean, at least he came clean in the end and saved my mom from that swindler. Hey, rich girl, good luck. And, um, feel free to keep in touch. So, what now? Well, mom is settling back into French life. She has a new job and a chic apartment. I go and stay with her each weekend, and it's good to finally spend time with the real her. As for Frankie, well, we send each other lots of Snapchats. So, okay, maybe I kind of like him. I'm planning to visit him in the summer. Hopefully my next trip to the U.S. won't be as crazy as my last one. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kat, which is short for Catherine, but only my mom calls me that. My dad's Indian, and my mom's American. They met back when he was working over here. Then they fell in love got married, and had me. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, and they split up before I was born. In India, when you marry, it's meant to be for life. But still, my parents got divorced, so the reason for that must have been really serious. So serious that till this day, I still don't know. Every time I asked about it, my parents would just ignore me and change the subject. Anyway, I've always lived with my mom, but my dad lives close by. Most kids from broken homes hate not having both parents around all the time, but this never bothered me. Don't get me wrong, I love my dad and all, but I guess I couldn't miss what I didn't know. Besides, I had far bigger problems to deal with. Okay, so don't laugh, hear me out. I'm a tomboy, a fact which my mom hates. Yep, I detest wearing skirts and dresses, or anything girly and sparkly. Yuck! Give me basketball shorts and a baggy t-shirt any day. Also, I don't understand why some girls spend ages doing their makeup. Why would I want to make myself look like some living doll just to impress people? Please. I didn't get on that well with other girls. I guess I just had nothing in common with them. I didn't care about shopping and watching rom-coms. Nope. 
I'd much rather be kicking a ball around or playing video games. My best friend's a boy called Harry, and I've known him for, like, forever. He's the one who taught me how to ride a skateboard. Talk about an adrenaline buzz. Now I pretty much go everywhere on one. I'm like a real-life Bart Simpson. For my whole life, my mom's given me disapproving looks. From the time when I only invited boys to my sixth birthday party, tore the arms off the dolls she gave me, and point-blank refused to move when she booked me in for ballet classes. I just wasn't a tea-time-with-dolls-and-teddy-bears kind of girl, and I didn't understand why she couldn't just buy me trucks and action figures instead. Then on top of that, Mom only dressed me up in skirts and dresses. I had no option but to wear them and endure school feeling so uncomfortable. I mean, have you tried playing soccer in a frilly dress? Talk about ridiculous. The other boys always had to wait for me to straighten out my skirt or try and find the hairpins that kept tumbling out of my hair. I mean, seriously, those things were so lame. By the time I reached 12, I was done wearing girly clothes just to please my mom. So I wore comfy, passed-down clothes that I got from my cousins beneath the hideous dresses and took them off en route to school. I was also so sick of my long, boring hair. So one day, I snuck into the barbers after school and got an undercut. Then one evening, I was chilling on the couch when Mom pointed at my hair and in a horrified voice said, Catherine, what have you done to yourself? I hadn't realized the way I was lying meant some of my undercut was on show. I just shrugged and replied, It's my hair, so I can do what I want with it. Why would you want to make yourself look ugly? She shouted. It's not ugly. It's cool. My mom looked so shocked. She grounded me for a month, and during that time, she barely spoke to me. The quarreling didn't end there. Over the next few years, it seemed like every little thing I did annoyed her. From chewing on gum to refusing to wear a dress to my cousin's wedding, you name it, it made her mad. On loads of occasions, she shouted at me that she wished I was normal. I didn't get it. My friends and teachers didn't treat me like I was an alien. So why did my mom? One time, when I was about to leave and go and skateboard with Harry, she actually accused me of being a lesbian. I just rolled my eyes at this. For the record, I'm not. I've had crushes on boys before. Anyway, my dad was a lot more chilled than mom. He's totally okay with me being a tomboy. One time, he even sent me a gift box with this really cool sports jersey and shorts in it. I stuck it in my wardrobe to hide it from mom, but she still managed to find it and threw it all in the trash. As I questioned her why she did that, she replied, If you want to live like a boy that much, you should move in with your dad. This made me so mad. So I packed a bag and went to dad's place. He was bugged out by what my mom had done, but still, he told me I should forgive her and that I couldn't live here for good with him as he couldn't be home all the time and take care of me like mom did. Yeah, right. More like he knew mom would never let this happen. It's like she hated me, but she still wanted me around so she had someone to moan at. I stayed with dad for a few days until he had to go on a business trip. Then I had to reluctantly go home, though. I was still kind of sulky at my mom. Then came the bombshell as I just arrived home. Mom sat me down and told me that she was dating some new guy called Max. Wow. I knew mom and I weren't close, but I had no idea she'd been dating some new dude. We're planning the wedding, and of course I want you to be my bridesmaid, but you'll have to wear a dress. What? She'd known the guy for five minutes, and now she was marrying him? Yeah. Whatever, I replied. My mom looked surprised. That's all? You seriously have no problem with this? I got up and walked upstairs to my room while saying, Yeah, mom, I'm okay with it. I support you doing what you like, not like you who always scolds me for my preferences. I could sense my mom being flustered without looking back. Ha! I'd won this round. So, Max moved in with his teenage daughter. Taylor, who's a year younger than me and goes to the same school. Talk about a Barbie. All she seems to be is a mass of shiny blonde hair and pink everything. Like, seriously, her rucksack, bed covers, curtains, even her phone's pink. But it's fine. Everyone has their own taste, so, like, whatever. Actually, it turns out that 
this new addition to the family wasn't as bad as I thought. Max is an okay guy who never looks down on me or comments on my tomboy ways. And about my mom, her focus towards me decreased. I was basically invisible to her. Now she had Taylor around. You think I'd be mad jealous, huh? Actually, no. Not at all. I was glad of the peace. But then mom started comparing me to that brat, saying how I should be more like her as we were both girls, but I acted like a little demon. What? Taylor was so pathetic. She screamed when she saw a roach in the kitchen and refused to get down from the worktop until it had been removed. Don't even get me started on how she acted like she couldn't reach the top shelves in the school's library, so other boys had to help her. Ugh, sickening. Then things got heated when Taylor stormed into my room and asked me to come down for dinner. Well, I probably was playing my music too loudly to hear her knocking on my door. But still, she wasn't welcome here. Then she took a quick look around my room. Okay, I'm not exactly the most organized person, but I know exactly where things are. I asked her, what are you gopping at? Nothing, she bluffed. Hey, why don't we go to the mall tomorrow? Let's go buy something cute. I need new clothes. And looks like you could use some help, too. I'm good, thanks. Crop tops aren't really my style. I'm not that much of a tryhard. I smirked at her. Oh, please. You wish you were like me. Look at yourself. You have the sense of fashion of a five-year-old boy. That's so childish. Who wears cargo pants anymore? Beats being a flamboyant ugly duckling who hides behind a zillion layers of pink glitter and foundation. Well, at least this ugly duckling will soon become a swan. But you, you're stuck being a nobody forever. No wonder mom hates you. I stared at her with hatred. Who was she to judge me in my own house? I needed to teach this brat a lesson. I charged towards her and yanked back her hair. She yelled at me to stop. Then at that moment, my mother appeared and shouted at me. Catherine, stop this at once. You need to grow up. Me? I shouted back. She just told me you don't love me. Well, she has a point. No one could love someone who acts like this. Look in the mirror. Taylor only said what we're all thinking. You're 17 already, for God's sakes. Grow up a little and give me a break. What was mom saying? She was taking the side of some random girl that only just moved in over her actual daughter? Great. There's zero use fighting with these close-minded morons. I let go of Taylor and pushed her and my mom out of my room, screaming at them, Fine! You two go and live happily ever after in your pink, fake, girly world! Then I slammed the door in their dumb faces. I was so done with them. I was so done with everything! Hey, get up! Who are you? What are you doing in my room? What? Excuse me? Who are you? This is my room! This guy was totally crazy. He insisted this was his room, even though I picked the key up from reception just two hours ago. What do you mean you got the key? I checked in first and just left the key at the reception desk to go out and buy some stuff. Whatever. I like the beach view here, so I'm staying. Unbelievable! Then he pulled out his phone and called reception. Okay, so I'm Liana, and I'm in the tropical paradise of Bali. My dream vacation wasn't off to a great start, thanks to this Charles guy trying to kick me out of my perfect beach view bungalow. Poof! Okay, now listen. They admit they gave you the wrong key. He pointed at his phone. Now, go back to reception, get the right one, and they'll probably give you a free treatment in the spa or something as compensation. No chance. I frowned at him. I like this room. How about you leave and go and enjoy a free spa treatment or whatever? Hell no! He growled at me. I paid for it, so I'm staying put. After that, we continued to quarrel until I felt a pain in my chest. And the next thing I knew... I'd fainted. Ugh. I guess it was just far too hot here for arguing. He put a pillow under my head and said, Miss, you can stop pretending now. Wake up. I had a feeling he was staring at me, but I didn't move. Fine. 
keep on playing your little pretend games. But I'm not leaving this room either. Ah, oh, silence. He must have given up. But then I felt a weight next to me on the bed. Without a second thought, I opened my eyes and leaped off the bed. Oh, turns out he wasn't trying to harm me. Instead, he was just sitting on the side and opening his laptop. Oops. He rolled his eyes, told me to go, and then started typing away. I swished my hair back, then said, In your dreams? Now, I'm off to enjoy this sunny day. When I come back, I don't want to see your face. After that, I left and spent the rest of the day relaxing on the beach. Bali was just so beautiful. At night, I returned to the bungalow and was ready to fall into bed. Hello, I said as I walked inside. Whoa, he wasn't there. I'd won the Battle of the Bungalows. I used the last of my energy jumping up and down on the bed and singing out, He left, I win, he's a loser, I'm a winner. Then I curled up into bed and started to drift off. Smash! I jolted upright. The window had been broken, and lingering at the foot of my bed was a tall, dark figure. I screamed at the top of my lungs, but they lunged forward and covered my mouth with their hands. Shut up, they whispered in my ear, then pulled their mask off. It was Charles. Confused, I blurted out, What the? Why did you break the window? Quick, grab your things. I pushed him off me and sat there with folded arms. Nice try, but if this is your way of kicking me out, it won't work. I'm not leaving. Suddenly, another man entered the room. Charles placed his mask back on and quickly grabbed the lamp from the bedside table and threw it at the man. I grabbed my bag in a panic while Charles took something from his backpack and then he led me out of the room. We took the back road out of the bungalow and headed into the forest. Where are we going and who is he? I questioned, but he remained silent. Say something. What's going on? Shut up for a minute. Now, I'll take you to the airport to leave this island. Charles grumbled. It was pitch black, and I was trampling through the forest in flip-flops. Ugh! Then, to make it even worse, I tripped over a branch and busted my knee. Great! He lowered his back and said, Get on. I was a bit surprised at first. Hmm. Maybe he wasn't as mean as I first thought. After a while, he decided we should rest in the forest till dawn. Charles fell asleep the second he hit the ground. I couldn't sleep, and then I thought back on the incident in the bungalow. Thinking about it, I remembered Charles grabbing something from his bag. So I crept over to him and slowly reached for his pocket to see what it was. Suddenly, he grabbed my arm tightly. Charles, let me go! I hissed out. My arm started to hurt. Ouch! Look, this is a dangerous business I'm in, he said as he let go of me. I'm trying to keep us both safe. Okay, I could really see worry in his eyes, so I muttered out, fine, then rubbed my arm. After a ridiculously uncomfortable night of zero sleep, he nudged me at dawn and told me to start walking. He took my hand and led me forward. I guess it was nice that he was so focused on protecting me, but, er, why did he keep looking at his phone? Um, are we lost? I asked. He kept his eyes on the screen and shook his head. Then he led me into the other direction, and then another. Yep, we were so lost. After what felt like hours of walking in circles, I slumped down on a rock and pulled a water bottle out of my bag. Let's just find the hotel, I suggested. No, we can't. Going back is more dangerous. But, fine. Can you at least tell me why we're sweating our butts off out here? I suppose I've implemented you, he sighed out. Still, you have to take this to your grave. I won't tell. Promise. Through after this, he took a USB stick out of his pocket. The president of the company I work for is carrying out illegal activities, and this is proof. Whoa, you're like James Bond! I smiled as I passed him the water bottle. 
Hardly. He laughed. Then he thanked me as he took the water and drank half of it without hesitation, then offered me the rest. He told me he was working for another company and had been sent in to investigate. So you're betraying the president? I asked skeptically. Kind of. Yes. By the way, I know you just wanted a nice vacation, but I've accidentally dragged you into this mess. I'm so sorry. Don't worry. I guess this is kind of exciting. But this is the summer getaway with the most insects I've ever had. I swatted a mosquito away. I heard him laugh, but hang on. Why was he all blurry? I slurred out. Uh, is your head heavy? Then I saw him faint in front of me, and a few seconds later, the world turned black. I flickered open my eyes. My head hurt. I was tied to a chair. And so was Charles. There were some scary-looking guys staring at us. Oh no, this couldn't be good. One man walked over to Charles and in a stern tone said, Charles, hand over the USB, and no one gets hurt. I don't know anything about a USB, he muttered out. I don't want to give out threats with her here. But if you insist, one of the bodyguards walked towards me, grabbed my hair, and pulled it backward. If you don't find value in her life, just keep it and watch her die. Stop! Leave her out of this! I don't have the USB. I dropped it somewhere in the forest. Then he turned to me. I'm so sorry I got you into this. The man sneered. Stop being so emotional, Charles. It doesn't suit you. I was shaking with fear as the man pulled something out from his back and pointed at me. Last chance, Charles? He shouted out, No! It's in her pocket! He must have snuck it in there when we were in the forest. Did he really believe that I would escape and expose the evidence? Then... <laughs> Cut! Good job, guys! We should be nominated for an Oscar award after this. I joked while the men kneeled down and untied me. About time, I said snidely as I took the USB out of my pocket and began spinning it with my fingers. I peered down at Charles and smirked. Thanks for protecting me and everything, but it turns out I have what I needed. What? Who are you? Charles asked in shock. So I put him out of his misery and told him everything. Yeah, I'm the daughter of the company's president, the same said company that he stole top secret information from. My father asked me to go and find him. The wrong reception key was a setup, and my water bottle has a mild sedative in it. You don't understand. What your father did was illegal, he insisted. I rolled my eyes. Yeah, yeah, whatever you say. I started walking away. Please, see for yourself. Look at the USB. I chewed on my lip. Poor Charles. He was no match for me or my father. Soon, we'd all be on a plane and flying back to the U.S., and then he would pay for what he did. Well, that was a job well done, so now it was time to relax with a glass of champagne. After all, I deserved it. One simple extraction back home, and my father's company would be saved, and Daddy's little girl would get a pat on the shoulder for yet another job well done. Hooray! But I must say, I kinda pity Charles. Being a pawn in somebody else's game, he was really nice, and clever too, but not enough to see all this coming, apparently. I took the USB out of my pocket and stared at it. But what secrets did my father keep? We didn't have anything fishy, right? My father did talk a lot about how hard he worked, and how honestly he conducted himself. So why did he specifically ask me not to peek at the file? Hmm... A little look wouldn't hurt, right? I know, I know. It's not very good of me to disobey my father, but come on, I'm his daughter. I'm set to take over from him anyways. So consider this a double check, eh? Just to be sure. <gasps> 
I regret looking at that file. I truly do, as the truth was unbearable. It turns out, my father had been lying to me from the very beginning, so Charles was actually telling the truth. He was indeed stealing dirty secrets from my father to bring it to the light. Ironic, isn't it? I laughed at him for being so gullible and believed the lies about my father's company, while it was me who got lied to. These truths were hard to swallow. I bore the legacy of a lifetime of scamming and cheating. No, I didn't want to live like that. It was just so wrong. As I delivered both the USB and Charles to my father, I knew what I needed to do. So I held the USB out to my father and said, Daddy, I looked at it, so I now know everything. Please stop. Liana, so your father turned himself in and will be in jail for a while. So what do you plan on doing with the company? I was quiet for a moment. This was a big question. Should I continue with my father's business or put an end to it once and for all? I thought back to the day when I confronted my father. But princess, I did it all for you. It's your legacy. I don't want to live with dirty money, dad. You've always been my hero, but now I'm just ashamed of you. His face fell, and I saw the sadness in his eyes. Seeing my father like that was the worst feeling in the world. Then it looked like he realized something. My father quietly nodded, handed me the president of the company seal, and sadly left the room. I'm afraid that I would repeat my father's mistake. So, taking a deep breath, I looked the journalist directly in the eyes and assertively said, After careful consideration, I've decided to close the company. After the conference, I was on my way out of the building when Charles caught up with me and asked, Well, Liana, what will you do now? I shrugged. I don't know. I suppose anything is possible. Although, I do need a place to stay first. I can't return to mine. I can't bear it. Well, um, if you'd like, you could stay with me. Charles smiled at me. Yeah, I'd like that. Then grinning, I added, as long as you don't try to kick me out this time, or drag me through a forest. I hate what my father did, but in the end, he did own up to his crimes and is paying the price. As for me, I was just going to take one day at a time and see where life took me. And if that just so happened to involve a certain James Bond wannabe, then so be it. Did this fence have to be so high? Oh no, that didn't sound good. It was time to get out of here. But, ah! Uh, I seem to be stuck. Suddenly, a security team was blinding me with a flashlight and telling me not to move. Not that I could anyway. <sighs> they dragged me down. Then the next thing I knew, I was being pushed into a chair and interrogated by security guards. But all they got out of me was silence. A few minutes later, Mr. and Mrs. Langston showed up. Yeah, they're the wealthy couple who owns this mansion. They're the people that I was looking for. I suppose I did owe them an explanation. I'm sorry for this disturbance, but it's not what you think. I saw your job advert for a housemaid, and I wanted to apply. But the guard said I was too young and refused to let me in. The thing is... My dad has a rare heart condition, and if he doesn't receive treatment soon, then chances are he won't make it. I really don't have any other choice. So please can I have the job and also six months salary advance? Right at that moment, a girl my age fell into the room, peered at the Langstons, then started laughing. Carla, this is not acceptable. Aren't you ashamed of your appalling results for the Francis Academy entrance exam? You should be studying hard to redeem yourself. 
Not out partying at this hour. This Carla girl just rolled her eyes at them, then wobbly walked off. I noticed Mr. Langston comforting his wife, who seemed to be in much distress at the girl's inconsiderate behaviors. So this must be their daughter then. They sure seem to take her education seriously. And she applied to my school. Hmm, that gave me an idea. You know, if you want to improve Carla's academic performance, I can help you. They both gave me skeptical looks, so I showed them my academic records and told them how I was a valedictorian and had successfully scored a scholarship at Francis Academy. On hearing about my achievements, any apprehensions they had soon faded. And so, they'd come up with a plan. A risky one. They would pay for my dad's hospital fees until he fully recuperated if I took on the identity of Carla and flew to South Korea to study at an international high school there, while Carla would take my place and enroll at Francis Academy just as they wished. This deal sounded like the answer to my prayers, but I knew it would be tricky. Pretending to be somebody else in a completely different country was beyond my understanding, so I agreed to do it, but only on two more conditions. First, a guardian must be present, who would take care of all my paperwork and stuff. Second, after I completed the deal and returned, the Langstons had to help me get into my dream school, the prestigious GBA University, obviously. They gave it a thought, then shook my hand in agreement. It looked like we had a deal! The next thing I knew, I was in an elite neighborhood in Seoul, Korea. Whoa, talk about luxury. So this was what it felt like to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Mr. Preston dropped me off at school and repeatedly told me not to draw attention to myself. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, Mr. Preston is the Langston's lawyer. And according to the contract, he's also my guardian. He seems oh so serious. But I guess he's okay. Whoa, this school looked so modern, the architecture was a work of art all in itself. I wandered around the endless corridors and tried to find my class. Everyone seemed quite friendly, and the class president, Minjun, even gave me a guided tour. All the students' outstanding paintings, photos, and models were displayed all across the campus. Countless classrooms of different subjects, from science to art just made me gasp in awe. I was admiring the artwork, when suddenly Minjin blurted out, Sorry, I've got to go. Miss Lee is looking for me. It'll only take a few minutes, so wait here for me, okay? Then he rushed off. So I lingered around the hall. That's when I spotted a group of girls nearby. I recognized the one from my last class. I'm sure her name was Isabella. I was about to walk over to greet them, when I realized they had this one girl cornered and were making fun of her hairband. Ugh! Where did you get that horrid thing from? I suppose it must have come from some thrift shop or something. I heard that's where poor people shop. <laughs> Ugh, this whole thing disgusted me. They outcasted someone just because she didn't come from ridiculously rich households like them. Ugh, I knew that poor girl's feeling all too well. I gotta help her. But I didn't want to get anyone's back up and draw attention to myself. Hmm, what could I do? Ah, got it. Hey, the teacher's coming. I'll stall her for you guys. Run! My plan worked a treat. As Isabella and her friends nodded at me, then rushed off. I then went over to the girl asking if she was okay. Get away from me! She flinched me off her and then ran off. Huh? I was only trying to help. As I turned around, I saw Minjin looking at me. A bit impressed, I think. He told me that the students here were divided into two groups. 90% are rich, and the remaining 10% are poor kids entering under scholarships. Most of the students are quite friendly to each other. Well, except those I just witnessed. Isabella's part of the rich kid group, who think their upbringings make them superior to others. She's often mean to the 10% group, as she believes they don't deserve to be here. And as you can guess, that girl they upset? She's called Susie. She's in the 10% group, and she's the smartest student in our year. 
What nonsense! School is school. We're here to study and should all be treated equally. Too right, new girl. I knew there was something different about you. The next day, when class was over, Isabella tapped on my shoulder and thanked me for the warning. Then she asked me to join her group for lunch. I was about to politely refuse when Minjin appeared and asked me to join him. Phew. Thanks to Minjin, I had an excuse to quickly flee the scene. However, I did look back and see that Isabella was giving this offended look. After that, Minjin and I started hanging out more. We soon became close friends, and we both decided that the dynamics around here needed to change. So, we set out to help the 10% Club. One lunchtime, Isabella and her clan purposely bumped into this boy, causing him to spill food all over himself. While they laughed and pointed at him, I rushed over there, took the food, and slammed it onto Minjin's face. Minjin immediately understood my intention. Then he also took a handful of noodles and smeared it all over Isabella. Cue the canteen erupting into one big, messy food fight. <laughs> Another time, the school was preparing for a cultural fair. One boy from the 10% group had this awesome idea to open a food stall serving traditional dishes from different countries. Everyone agreed, apart from, yep, you guessed it, Isabella and her snooty besties. Such a peasant. Too used to working as a waiter to serve others, huh? I winked at Minjin. Then we stayed behind and secretly wrote Isabella and her friend's names on the list of participants and submitted it to the teacher. Now, they had no choice but to serve food at the super crowded fair. The funniest part was they finally got a taste of their own medicine when the 10% group made the most of ordering them around and complaining. Ew, this ratatouille is too bland. Add some more salt. And this milk tea is too sweet. Start a new batch with less sugar. I have to admit, I was enjoying watching the mean kids squirm, but I guess my enjoyment hadn't gone unnoticed, as afterward, Isabella approached me. Those peasant kids aren't at the same level as you and I. I suggest you put more care into who you choose to associate with, or you could end up being treated like they are. Whatever. I just rolled my eyes, walked away from her, then continued to hang out with my friends in the 10% group. Isabella and her minions gave me dirty looks, but due to the Langston's name and fortune, that's all they could do. Just like that, my high school years passed by. I had some great friends. And guess what? Yep, I was now dating Minjin. I loved being here in South Korea, and I'd even grown fond of Preston, who despite being a grumpy gut, now felt like family to me. I mean, don't get me wrong. I missed my family back home like crazy. But Dad was getting better now, and we regularly FaceTimed. As amazing as my life was now, deep down I always felt like I was living in a dream. None of this truly belonged to me, and everything would be over as soon as I left this place. And eventually, my last week here arrived. As I was studying for my last ever exam, the SAT, I received a message from an unknown number. I know your secret. Drop out of the test, else I'll expose you. What? Who could it be? I called the number and a distorted voice answered the phone. I begged them to tell me why they were doing this, but they just replied, You don't need to know. Just do as I said. Then they hung up. Luckily for me, Preston isn't just an amazing lawyer, he's also a tech genius. Thanks to him, we tracked down the location of the phone. Hmm. I bet you're just as curious as I am to find out who it was. And now was the moment of truth. Huh? No way! Standing there looking startled was... Susie! Why would she do this to me? It made no sense. I mean, I know we weren't friends, but I had nothing against her. Why did she despise me to the point of willing to ruin my life like this? Please let me explain. Ever since you arrived here, I lost my top spot at school, which means I've also lost a full scholarship to college. My family will never be able to afford it themselves, so I decided to investigate you. And that's when I found out that you were not the real Carla Langston, 
and you got paid by her parents to achieve all these academic records for her. I get why you're upset, but you didn't have to blackmail me. You don't strike me as someone who would do such a thing, so it's kind of disappointing that you did. I'm not. I... I'm a dead end, Irene. You have to understand. This is my entire future I'm losing here. And what for? So some rich, spoiled girl can get into college without doing any of the work? <sighs> it seemed like I had a lot of thinking to do. In the end, I realized all I felt towards Susie was pity. This was all my fault, and it wasn't fair for someone as capable as Susie to have her entire future ruined because of me. So I had to be the bigger person here. I decided to ask the Langstons to give Susie the spot at GBA University which was previously reserved for me as part of the deal. I mean, no worries. With this big brain, I could easily get in there on my own, right? And so, as soon as I was done with the test, I quietly left South Korea behind, without saying goodbye to anyone, including Minjin. Susie and I boarded the same flight back to the state. She couldn't help but thank me all the way there. And, well, let's just say, by the time the plane landed... We became good friends, but things didn't all go as swimmingly as I intended. It turned out Carla was even more negligent than first thought. All she managed to get was a high school diploma with shockingly bad grades. These were now my bad grades. My dream of attending a prestigious university was over. <sighs> I just have to make do with a community college instead. A year flew by and there wasn't a single day that I didn't think about South Korea or Minjin. I couldn't talk to him anymore. I promised the Langstons I'd cut all ties with my life there. I mean, Susie was the exception. One day while going out with Susie, she was showing me something interesting on Facebook, when we happened to scroll past a post of Minjin's, which read, Finally I found you, the love of my life. My heart sank. Wow. It looked like he'd found someone else, while well, my heart still pined for him. <sighs> but life still goes on, and a week after that, I was waiting for Susie outside of her college, daydreaming how this could have been my life. I saw a familiar face heading towards me. Was that... Minjin? But wait! He was with a girl. Carla! Hang on, his Facebook post was about her? The love of his life was Carla? I couldn't do this right now, so I willed back tears as I took a deep breath and turned to walk away. But suddenly, I felt a hand pull me back. It was Minjin. It's really you. I finally found you. I've been looking ever since graduation, and then my information led me here and to... Me! Carla appeared next to him and smirked at me. Hey. Who am I to stop the course of true love? So I told him your real name and helped him search for you. I mean, you're smart, so I figured you'd attend this university too. No, you messed up my grades, remember? Anyway, it doesn't matter anymore. I turned and looked at Minjin. I'm so sorry, Minjin. I wanted to tell you everything, but I couldn't. He took my hand in his and gave me this adoring smile. I found you. And trust me, right now, that's all that matters.